Picture yourself standing before God in heaven's great courtroom. God looks around and says, there's none righteous, no, not one, which is what Paul is saying, okay? There's nobody righteous. What do you say in your defense? You say nothing. You're speechless. You know the judge has spoken something true. Your heart begins to race, and all of a sudden you hear something, and you go, who's that? A lawyer takes his place between you and the judge and looks at you with love in his eyes. He faces the judge and says, may it please the court, Father. The defendant has put his faith not in himself, not in the law, not in riches, but the defendant whom I love has put his faith in me. Very well, the judge says, on the basis of your faith in my son, Jesus Christ, I hereby pronounce you not guilty. That is justification by faith, okay? You get justified in the courtroom of heaven, in the courtroom of God on judgment day, because you've put your faith in Jesus, Jesus becomes your lawyer, and although you're not righteous, you're not in right standing with God, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, I'll take the penalty, they're justified now. And God says, I'll justify you, just as if you'd never sinned because of you putting your faith in Jesus. That's how powerful justification by faith is, and that's a core essential doctrine to the Christian faith. That's a core central false doctrine to the Christian faith. Hello and welcome to Only One Truth. Listen, I want to tell you this first, that we bring out a lot of different false teachers because the Bible tells us that in the last days there would be many seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Today and the day that we live in, a lot of people are not going by what the Scripture actually says, but they have their own opinions that are mixed in. This is very dangerous for the believers. The Bible says in 1 Timothy that in the last days, we would live in perilous times. Perilous means dangerous. Well, what is the danger? Here is the danger. The danger is false te teaching. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said that the day would come when that men would not endure sound doctrine, but would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. This is what we have today. They won't endure the sound teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible clearly tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that if anyone preach otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness or holiness, he is proud knowing nothing. So we must expose these things. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So these are fruits of darkness that are coming forth from ministers who call themselves ministers, rather, that are saying things that are not in the Word of God, that are saying things actually contrary to what is in the Word of God. And this makes them a liar, the Scripture says, because they are not telling the truth. They have left the words of Jesus Christ. And I'll give you a for instance real quick. The Bible says, "Go." In, Jesus said in John 8, 11, go and sin no more. Well, they're teaching today that you can't go and sin no more, that you'll sin till the day you die, and they excuse sin. They're teaching that you can die in your sin and go to heaven in your sin. When Jesus spoke the opposite in John 8, 11, 8 21, excuse me, he says in John 8, 21, if you die in your sin, you will not be with him. These are important factors. Why? Because this is your eternity we're talking about. This is very, very serious. And I make the seriousness of it. Today, we're going to be exposing one called Isaiah Saldivar. Isaiah Saldivar is preaching that you can be saved and go to heaven in your sin, which is contrary to what the doctrine says. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, he says you're saved from your sin, not in your sin. This leaves out when people preach like Isaiah is preaching. It leaves out the place for repentance. And the scripture is very clear. In Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus said, and verse 5, Repent or you shall likewise perish. Repentance is the key to salvation. Peter said this on the day of Pentecost when they, were, when they asked him, What must we do to have eternal life? And the first thing Peter said after their hearts were pricked, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for your remission of sins. So repentance was required. 
In Acts chapter 17, the Lord says that he winked on things of the past, but he said today he calls all men everywhere to repent. You may ask, well, what does repentance mean? This is a very important question because some people are very confused about this. They think that repentance means simply asking God for forgiveness. That is not, that is not what repentance means. Repentance must be something that comes forth from the heart, first of all. It must be a change of the heart with a change of the mind, which are both synonymous. When you change your mind, change your heart, then your behavior also changes. Repentance is when you come by faith to Jesus Christ and you change your heart and you change your mind and you say, you know what, I am sorry for my sin. I turn from my sin never to go back to sin again. I commit to God never to sin again. And that is in your heart, a complete reversal of how you lived before. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is so clear when it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are past, and all things have become new. Now today, in today's teachings of these false teachers, they get mixed up with, between the Mosaic law and being under the law of Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25 that we are under the law of Christ, but they want to say you're under no law, and they confuse what the law of Christ is with the Mosaic law of circumcisions, washings, festival days of observing those, and Sabbaths. So let's look at, let's listen a minute to Isaiah, and we'll take it from there. Salvation, if we attempt to in any way apply our works to our salvation, the truth of the gospel is defiled. So anybody that says, I did this, that's why I'm saved or how I'm saved, you're defiling the gospel because it's not by works, it's a gift. It's not wages due. It's the gift of God, okay? What he's saying is, he's saying that he's using it in, in a way that, like, if you're trying to work for your salvation, this is true in one aspect. If a person is leaving out Christ and he's trying to work for his salvation to earn it, you could never do that. Even in the Old Testament, the Bible says before Christ was had died and crucified, that the blood of bulls and he goats could never take away sin. But the blood of Jesus and what he did takes away our sin. In other words, it washes it away. It washes it clean. All of your past sin, when you come to God in true repentance, your sin is washed away. But there is works that do come forth, and we're going to show that clearly in the Scripture. The Scripture talks about when that repentance takes place, repentance is a change of heart, a change of mind, which is a work. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11, you'll read, here is the steps to salvation. The steps are, first of all, a godly sorrow, is what the Scripture says. A godly sorrow is a brokenness, a contrite, and a poor spirit. You'll also find this in Isaiah 66, 2. The Lord says, it says a broken and contrite, a poor spirit, one that, that cries out to God and trembles at his word, he will in no wise cast out. What great news. So when you come to God in this brokenness and this contrite spirit, committing to God to depart from your sin, like it says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 13, it says, he that covers his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesses and forsakes his sin shall be shown mercy. That's exactly it. It's the confession of your sin and a forsaking of your sin. This is what brings salvation, the Bible says, because godly sorrow leads to repentance, as we said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and repentance is the turning around. And when the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there, there it is, You're a confession, a forsaking, and then a cleansing where there's no more sin. And he walks clean and free from sin. And the Bible says, so it works godly sorrow, repentance, then salvation. He doesn't say salvation, then godly sorrow, then repentance. He gives the order of obtaining salvation there in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, and 11. It must be done in that order, just like Peter said in, in Acts 2, 38. Repent, that's the first step. Re with here is godly sorrow. They already had godly sorrow in, 
in Acts chapter 2. That's why the Bible says their hearts were pricked. That showed they had a godly sorrow. So their next step was to repent, to turn from the sin. And that's why the Scripture's clear, that, but he's leaving this out. He's just saying, well, you just receive Christ by faith. Without repentance, that does nothing. The devil can do that. But you must repent, like the Scripture says, or you will perish, as the Lord said. So repentance then leads to salvation, and salvation is not to be repented of. In other words, you don't go back to sin again. So this is clear. Now, he's, taking some, he's going to be taking some Scriptures from Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 is talking about mostly Abraham and David. But he'll use an example that is very familiar to a lot of people who understand with what uh, uh, these doctrines are that are false today of, of what has been brought, brought back in with Martin Luther and others of telling you that um, because of the blood of Jesus and because of what he did, that he took your place on the cross and by taking your place, this was reform theology is what they call it. By him taking your place on the cross, he gave you his righteousness, and he took on your sin. Nowhere in the Bible does it say such a thing. Jesus did not go to the cross as a filthy sinner. He went to the cross, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 says, he went to the cross as a spotless lamb. So, and we, you'll see this also in Isaiah chapter 53. He offered himself that way. He never became a sinner. He never put hit your sin on him and became that filthy sinner. That is a lie. That is not true. So they'll take this and they'll apply this and say, because of this, then you are imputed righteousness because of the new covenant with what Christ did. But they'll use examples of David and Abraham. Well, David and Abraham couldn't have been imputed with Christ's righteousness because Christ had not yet died and re resurrected, yet they were imputed righteousness. What did that mean? That meant that they came to Christ with a heart full of faith, and that faith, with that faith, the works followed their faith, of course. The Bible says that Abraham believed God, and, and he offered up Isaac, his son. That was the works that were there with his belief combined together. The Bible's very clear with that. It also says that, that in, in, uh, in the book of um, James chapter 2, says, was not Abraham our father justified by works which he had, when he had offered Isaac? See, God told him, go take your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him up as a sacrifice. Abraham could have said, well, I'm just going to believe by faith that I did. I can, I'm just going to believe by faith and do nothing. He would have never obtained what he, the imputed righteousness if he had in his heart to do nothing, but he had in his heart the intent to do it, and he did it, as we can very well say. David was the same way. David was imputed righteousness because he believed God and he walked with the Lord. David even said this, and some people frown at it, but you can go to, uh, to the book of Psalms, chapter 18, and verse 20 through 24, and you'll see that David said, the Lord hath rewarded me according to my righteousness. That's right. He said, according to my righteousness. Some people would fall over backwards thinking that. Yes, David was rat righteous. No, it was not filthy rags. Don't use that because that's a scripture taken out of context that these, these reformed teachers will also speak of. But that's a, that's a lie from the pit of hell. David said, I kept myself from sin. Did you know that in, in the book of 1 Kings chapter 15 and verse 5, it said that David walked all, all of his life in the sight of the Lord without, without sin all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So to say that David was imputed in his sin is absolutely wrong. David was lost in his sin. David, if he would have died in his sin, would have gone to hell just like anybody else would have. But David, David had a real repentance. So these things of saying this is, this is imputed righteousness because of what Christ did, they're not even using the right scriptures because this is talking about Abraham and, and it's talking about David. They, they weren't dead, but it shows that when a person's heart changes, they are imputed righteousness when they walk in what the Lord said. We attempt to in any way apply our works to our salvation, the truth of the gospel is defiled. So anybody that says, I did this, that's why I'm saved or how I'm saved, you're defiling the gospel because it's not by 
works. It's a gift. It's not wages due. It's the gift of God, okay? There's only one work that we can count on. Now, there is a work. Let me make this clear. There is a work that saves us. There's actually only one work that saves us, and that is the work that Christ did on the cross. I just mentioned in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, they profess that they know him like he's doing. But in works, they denying him. So if you're not doing works and you're doing sin, then you're denying Jesus. He says they deny him being abominable, being disobedient. Read the scripture. Titus 1.16 is clear. Works must come forth. The Bible says in James 2.24 that you are justified by works and not by faith alone. He's trying to say it's by faith alone. Of course, nobody's trying to work their way to salvation. The only, the only way to have salvation is through faith in Christ, of believing what he did and receiving what he did and counting on him to do that. He's the only one that can wash away your past sin. But it's only through coming to a place of repentance. Repentance, Jesus said very clearly in Luke 13, 3 and 13, 5, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. The scripture is clear in 2 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11 that godly sorrow, a broken and contrite spirit like in Isaiah 66, 2, and trembles at his word, comes to a repentance, a, a, a place of forsaking their sin. Like in Proverbs 28, 13, it says, he that covers his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesses and forsakes his sin shall be shown mercy. If you do not forsake your sin and confess it, you will not be shown mercy. He's saying, no, you don't have to confess your sin. The Bible said you must to be able to do, to do that in order to be shown mercy. So if you want to say that's a work, absolutely you can say that because you're justified by works and not faith alone. You get justified in the courtroom of heaven, in the courtroom of God on judgment day, because you've put your faith in Jesus, Jesus becomes your lawyer, and although you're not righteous, you're not in right standing with God, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, I'll take the penalty, they're justified now. Okay, he's saying you're not righteous. He's saying there's nobody that's righteous, and you're going to go before the judgment, judgment uh, courtroom before God. Well, we can all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible's clear on that in Romans 14 and also in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10. At 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10 is clear. It says there that... Um, uh, that we labor whether present or absent, that we may be acceptable by him. Now, most people are thinking, well, I, I don't need to be acceptable by Jesus. All I just need to do is just have faith in him. Well, the Bible's clear. It says you must be acceptable by him. People are thinking, well, I, I need to accept the Lord. No, the Lord doesn't have to measure up to you. You have to measure up to the Lord. Now, watch what it says. He said, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for those things in our body. Not that you're going to be judged for how much faith you have. You're going to be judged for those things in your body of what you've done, whether it's good or bad. As a matter of fact, in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, in the last chapter, chapter 22, Jesus comes back at the end, after all the writings of all the books and all the teachers in the Bible, and he says only those that obey the commandments of God will have the right to enter into the gates into the city. So let's go back up. He says there's none righteous. There's not anybody that's righteous. Really? Well, he must not read his Bible. If you go to the book of Luke, chapter uh, chapter 1, it talks about uh, two people there. It talks about the mother and father of John the Baptist. And what does he say about Zacharias and, uh, uh, Zach Zacharias and Elizabeth? These were the mother and father of John. Now, these people were really holy. Watch what he says in verse 41 and 42. We'll see. We'll go right to verse 42. They were, 41 says that Elizabeth... And, and uh, her husband, Zacchaeus, were filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice. Hold on, let's go a little bit further. Let's go back to verse uh, 6 here. It says, Elizabeth and, and uh, Zacharias, they were both, what? What's that word? Righteous? Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, Salvador, uh, Salvador, Isaiah, he says, nobody's righteous. Uh-oh, God, did you make a mistake in your word? maybe Mr. Salador didn't read this, or maybe he's just deceiving you because it says here they were both righteous, Elizabeth and Zacharias. That's the word of God. That's the God-breathed word, and he's saying, no, they're not righteous. And the Bible says, yes, they are righteous. Who are you believing? 
You know what you need to do? You need to recognize this man as a false prophet. You need to quit listening to him, get away from him, and get to the truth. You need to start searching out the Word of God for yourself and see what it says because I just caught him in a lie because he misquoted the Word of God. These people were righteous. Not only does it say that about him, he says they were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Did you hear that? They were blameless. They didn't sin. You could be blamed if you were sinning. Just like Isaiah you're supposed to be blameless. What do you mean? Because 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 says the requirement of somebody that's doing what you're doing, trying to teach or preach, must be blameless. But you're saying nobody can be blameless. Why in the world is it all over the Bible that says that? Who are you believing? You're going to believe Isaiah or are you going to believe the Word of God? If that's not enough for you, go to Titus chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. It gives the requirements for an elder or a teacher or a bishop or a pastor or whoever. And it says there that they must be blameless, pure, and holy. My, my, guys, listen to me. Why are you guys listening to all these false preachers, John MacArthur, John Piper, Isaiah, uh, Vlad, all these preachers, and they're immediately telling you, hey, I'm not blameless. I'm going to sin till I die. And I'm depending, I'm hoping that Jesus is going to plead for me. The Lord is telling you, look at what it says. Don't put yourself in a place to listen to somebody like this. They're saying outwardly they're not blameless. The requirements for them is they must be blameless. They're disqualified from being in the position that they're in. You must get away from this and go back to the Word of God. Do what Jesus said. Go and sin no more. Listen to him. Stop the sin in your life. Obedience is necessary for salvation. And open up your ears to hear the word of God and quit being deceived. Listen, I'm going to give you one more thing. This is very important. Jesus says, straight is the gate and narrows the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Now, today what they're trying to do is they're trying to broaden that way to make it to get more people in. And so they're saying things that are contrary to what Christ said. And they say it, that you can do these things, you can sin and make it. This is, listen to what Jesus said, beware. Beware of false teachers. They come to you in sheep's clothing, like Isaiah, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. How do you know? Jesus said, I'm going to tell you how you know. Isn't it Jesus wonderful? He tells you. He's not going to let you be deceived if you just listen to him. He says, this is how you know. By their fruit, you'll know them. You'll know them. Well, what do you mean fruit? He says, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot sin. These men are admittedly, they're admitting that they sin, and you're going to still listen to him when God told you, hey, that's a false teacher, get away from him, and you're still going to stay there and listen to him, and you're going to let him talk you into that? You need to listen to what God said. He's telling you how to recognize him. A good tree doesn't bring forth bad fruit. A good tree doesn't sin. A minister doesn't sin. That's the word of God. And then they're trying to get a, get, get, do away with the teachings of Christ. Christ is the one that said, go and sin anymore." morning. He said, well, you can't go sin anymore. But my Bible tells me in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, if any man preach otherwise and not consent unto the wholesome words of the Lord Jesus Christ, to what Jesus said, and the and words which is according to godliness and holiness, he is proud and doesn't know anything. Isaiah, you don't know anything. I didn't say that. The word of God said that. Listen to what the Word of God says. Go and sin no more. That's the worst thing come on you. God bless you. I hope this helped you today. I hope you'll pay attention to what was said. Because it wasn't me. It's the Word of God. You must obey the Word of God. Quit listening to these false teachers. You're welcome to join us at Only One Truth. We have services Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday nights. We're not, we don't want your money. We don't want anything. We just want to help you. If you truly want help, we're ready to help you to live blameless and holy, to make it for the bride. Jesus said in Ephesians 5, he's coming back for a church that's spotless, blameless, righteous. And he said, you can't even be. You must be. Quit the sin. Walk in holiness with the Lord. You can do it because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God bless you.